Um, Hello and welcome back to Zap to the Past and our coverage of the games that were reviewed in issue 2 of Zap 64. I am your host, Adrian Mills, and I am joined by my good friend and C64 aficionado, Graham Raddings. Last week we looked at our first batch of games from this issue and were demoralised by the excellent Theatre Europe, concerned that we may have missed a trick by not inviting friends round for a quick game of Mule, and had our rose-tinted specs well and truly crushed by Richard Petty's Talladega. If you haven't listened to last week's episode, then I suggest you go and do so. One last thing, please to note, is that there are a couple of swear words that do crop up every now and again. We're not the sweariest of podcasts, I have to say, but there is the old little one that does slip through in the heat of the moment. It's nothing major, but if it is an issue, then obviously please be warned that the odd one will slip through. Let's get on with things. Graham. Tell us what we have to look forward to in this episode. Well, we take a look at Quasimodo. We've got Grog's Revenge, that's Quest for Ties 2. We take a look at Big Mac. We look at the Dambusters. Blagger goes to Hollywood for some reason. Glider Pilot, should gliding be made into a, some kind of game? Probably not. And of course, we've got the Crapverts and the usual stuff. All to look forward to. Awesome. So, let's get on with the games. <laughs> Um, let's move on <clears throat> uh, to an unusual game, um, uh, Hyper Circuit, which was reviewed this month. Um, so what is Hyper Circuit? Hyper Circuit is an odd game. Um, interestingly, an early Chris Butler game. Yeah, a bit of a survival I blaster. I, I, I didn't know. Um, yeah, it's. I mean, Chris Butler, correct me if I'm wrong, I'm, I'm pretty sure I haven't got the right guy. It's this guy who did Commando, Ghosts and Goblins. Yep. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So it's an early, interesting, it's an early game from him. Um, it's an original game. Obviously, he got well known for doing very, very good Commodore 64 arcade conversions. Um, it's, you move around in in sort of the uh, grooves on a computer chip. Yeah, the circuitry, isn't it? So Yeah, the circuitry of a computer chip shooting shooting stuff. Uh, then your bullets follow the, the same path that you're on sort of thing. So you have to go around. I wasn't quite sure what was going on. Um, if I'm honest, it was a bit odd. Um, it's an interesting concept. I quite like the, you know, the, as a, as a shoot up. This was, this is a really good example of, again, like Super Pipeline, something that I could really see being an arcade game. Um, but, you know, what was, I don't, think, I probably never was, unless it's a Chris Butler conversion. I'm not sure about that. I mean, it could very well be. I mean, he's known for his, um, he's known for his arcade conversion, so it could be one I don't know about. Um, but it feels like an arcade game. It feels like something that I could play quite happily in the arcade. Um, the visuals look like that. They're, some, they're nice and smooth. I like the uh, turning animation, um, which was very nice. Um, but as ever, you know, with, with, with these games, it's really hard. Really, really hard. And <laughs> um, looked nice. Yeah, it's all right. It was all right. It was a, a, nice, ar- a nice arcade blast. I think, you know... I don't think there's much more. To, I've got not much more to say about it. Have you got anything no, more you want? No, I agree. I mean, I thought it's a clever little action shooter game. The idea of it is you've got to you've got to shoot enough enemies to get to the next level. That's the idea, and survive long enough. And there's waves of difficult things and things following you about. I like the idea of it being on the little circuitry and the, your bullets following the plane path. It was quite a nice little little uh, gameplay feature. It's a bit repetitive though, as these kind of games tend to be. Um, they start off, you know, level one and two, great. As soon as you get to level three, you think, okay, this is kind of similar. And when by the time you get to, all you know is there's going to be more enemies and more more difficulty, and that's how they ramp up the gameplay is by just adding more enemies to kill. Um, so it, that in that sense, it's an arcade game, and and it had that kind of arcade game repetitive ability. You could play it a bit more. You know, you could you wanted to go back and try again. The downside is, uh, for me, um, graphically amazing, programming-wise, clever, clever for its time, very fast, really fast scrolling. Um, the music, though, which was a little snippet of Mozart's um, 
one of Mozart's pieces um, for me it was so annoying after a while you're like <laughs> oh just make it stop you know there's certain parts of Mozart's music you can like but the rondo that is features in a lot of different things here and there and many games use that kind of you know yeah yeah this particular game it used the middle section so it used the kind of the refrain um but it just uses that over and over and over again you know so to the point where i suspect mozart would have got up out of his grave wherever he's buried and stomped over to um chris and gone no stop doing that in a german probably austrian accent or something so no <laughs> it's a strange, strange choice of strange choice sort of thing to use a uh, for for a game that's set on a computer chip, in a on made on a Commodore sixty four with a with a really good sound chip sort of thing that could do really good sort of synthesizer type <laughs> noises to try and emulate a classical piece of music for this. It's a strange choice, and you know if they've gone like maybe if they've gone like you know sort of burbling paradroid style noises in the background, that would have been I think a, a, a better think a better more choice. Functionary might have worked. Or I wondered if, because this game has got a lot of graphics in it, and there's a lot of full screen graphics moving around. Just in that memory. I, yeah, and I think just this is den- genuinely down to the limitations of the actual machine itself, because I think there's a lot in there. Well, that's why I think sort of thing, just using something that was just generating sounds in like Paradroid does for its opening title screen, that, boo, 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 that yeah, sort of yeah. noise, blips I think, would have, yeah, would have worked better in, in sort of creating the atmosphere and moving around a chip rather than. 300 year old yeah 300 year old dead composer yeah it didn't it didn't need to go full classical did it it could have just been it does kind of it is it is at odds with the old idea of it being set in computer circuitry and yeah that's what know, i thought but half you know, classical yeah so <laughs> it's a, it, it actually is a playable game i don't know what the price was for that game i don't know if it was a full price game or not but it was playable enough i just don't think it had the longevity that was those kind of games need because i but it's of its time. I keep saying this, but at that time, they didn't understand to make a game more complex, you can actually introduce new things that aren't the same thing over and over again, but with extra speed or extra quantity. Um, and that that's an arcade throwback. That's, you know, that's an app that is a proper arcade throwback to make a game more difficult, increase the number of enemies or increase the speed of the enemies, but keep it all in one screen, keep it all nice and simple. And I think there's a little bit of throwback to that kind of thinking but where it tries to break out the box a little bit, firing along the same lines as your main sprite and having to go in a specific way and trying to find a way around a maze, I thought it had little bits to offer there, but it's okay. It's, I wouldn't say it was amazing, though. The other thing as well, which I, I would pick up on, was um, I didn't think the actual chip track design was that intuitive or that good. I thought there were too many dead ends. You kept, I kept going down a route and then just getting to a dead end and sort of taking it out, turn left, oh, it's another dead end. I need to go back and... Uh, uh, it just it didn't it didn't feel particularly intuitive, and I'm thinking again, like what I said with um, give my regards to Broad Street. This is a game you're creating. Don't block me off all the time. You know, let, allow me. You know, you've designed this. Just give me a route round. If it's a long route, at least I keep at least I'm keeping going rather than going back the way I came. Yeah, there's 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 early hints in this though. The idea of being inside a circuit, the idea of that kind of going around little pathways in certain ways. You can start to see where people like Braybrook got their inspiration for Paradroid from when you start to look at little games like this. Now, there's hints of it, especially with the circuit breaking part of Paradroid. We'll come to that when we do Paradroid, but because that's probably almost an episode in its own right. But um, but um, I think Hyper Circuit is a an early arcadey style game with a little bit of a twist. It's just a little. Bit, it's a bit of a misfire for me, but so, yeah. It's it's just it's it's what I could I could see myself pumping a few ten p's into it in the arcade. Yes, um, because I think I would like you know it has that kind of arcadey style, and I think in in that respect. But yeah, for re- repeated play on a home computer, it does lack that certain v- v- uh, variety. Quite agree. Quite agree, old chap. Good stuff. There we go. Hype circuit. Not terrible. Not not top top draw, but still good. Still good. Uh, let's move on. We've got a couple more before we get have another break. Um, Quasimodo. <laughs> so we had Hunchback in episode zero. Now we've got his uh, his party name, um, Quasimodo. <laughs> this is what he puts on his uh, resume. <laughs> so it's essentially the same game. It's not. With- it's no. se- essentially, this is about a Hunchback running around, ringing bells, and doing similar stuff, right? It's but it's but it's borrowed gameplay. This and it's repetitive, horribly, horribly repetitive. This game, 
It's, been, it's more playable. The graphics are really good. Don't get me wrong. There's some really nice graphic touches in here. I've just put it. It's a graphic enriched hunchback variant, which is four words I never thought I'd ever say <laughs> in any sentence. I I I thought at first, my first impression of this was this is god awful, and then I played it a little bit more, and then I, and then I thought, do you know what? This is some weird. This is Tapper turned on its side. Um, uh, where you're because the first level okay, okay so Quasimodo first of all sees you on top of a wall with um, a load of cannonballs and little knights and ladders appearing that come up the wall and you have to throw the cannonballs down um, and at first I couldn't, I couldn't really do much I couldn't, couldn't get quite get the hang of it because the arrows they fire are annoyingly accurate or, or just <laughs> were, I couldn't yeah. get near them to throw the ball down them once I figured out that you could it was where they were placing the ladders I, I quickly progressed and so I, I, I managed to clear that screen sort of thing and then it's like okay you get this ladder going downward so it was like oh, okay I wasn't expecting that I thought, it was just gonna, I thought that was it All right, I thought this was going to be some kind of weird sort of tower ball defense thing um, thing and then you get so you get out of the ladder and then you pick up this spark for some strange reason at the bottom then you have to you strangely enough it then becomes like you, you climb the tower and become a you have to it becomes like a swinging from bell to bell but you, you have to what i quite liked you know you have to create inertia on the swing yeah, yeah, you have yeah, to swing the, back and forth, yeah, otherwise you're you not going to make the jumps. So this this was quite nice, and I, once I figured that, out, okay, you got to get this spark and put it in this place, and you got to carry on up the tower. Um, and I, I got to a point, sort of thing, where there was a, a bit where I had to jump across two bells or two. No, I think I got a bell, and was, but there were two bats, and the, the the bats were very annoying and kept killing me. Um, but I don't think I got very far. I mean, a few screens in, sort of thing. However, the the variety of what was going on drew me into playing this for longer than I thought I was going to when I first turned it on. Because I'd never played this, um, and so I had no idea what to expect. And so it was a bit of a learning curve as I went through it. But the different mechanics that it was using, that I mean, that, that opening section... I don't know if it's ever repeated again. I don't know. You know, it's a, it's a you know, you're, you're picking up balls and lobbing them downwards. You can also lob them from side to side should they get to the top. Um, there's, there's some nice stuff going on there. And, and it's, I, I called it an enjoyable, a very, fairly enjoyable multi-stage romp <laughs> was, was my description uh, with annoying bats. Yeah, there are annoying bats. No, it's, it's, it's like, a, it's got an arcade tonality. Um, the graphics aren't, that bad um i just felt and it's better than hunchback that has to be said because hunchback was yeah. alarmingly stupidly difficult it has similarities i suppose because it's about a hunchback hanging off bells <laughs> there's no way around that um you know it's back this is called quasimodo the other one was called hunchback you know they could have just put in brackets aka quasimodo <laughs> yes you know? and i'm not saying they're exactly the same game but thematically there's not much variation between them you know you're either people are either climbing a tower to get you or firing arrows at you there's only so much you can do with this there's only so much you can do with the source material yeah i wasn't sure <laughs> at one point it felt like i was picking something up to place it in a microwave yeah, exactly. Um, so it's I don't like, know what that was all about. But the idea of swinging across the bells is quite good, albeit it was really annoyingly hard. Um, but, you know, once you got the hang of the controls, it was okay. Um, it just felt a little bit like, you know, once you'd got kind of the controls and you got kind of the idea of the game, it, it felt like it was never going to offer you a lot more than you'd got. Um, and that's fine if that's what all it's all about. But, you know, if it had an interesting soundtrack or if it had, um, you know, a little bit more... No, there was a little bit more to it. It might have, you know, it might have fared better in my estimation. But you no, know, games like that always seem to suffer from a thing that they don't have, and this one just for me didn't have that kind of hook. I could, I could, I can absolutely one hundred percent understand that because it, it, it is, it's, it's. I felt it was, um, it's quite, a, it's quite muted. It feels almost understated, and I think that it, it I think with a with with a bit of better presentation. Um, if this if if this was in the hands of Palace, um, because this sort of not not absolutely one hundred percent sort of thing, but this put me in the mind of Antiriad. Yes, in, yes, in I that, can see that in that multi stage, multifaceted, different things, learning different things, doing different stuff. Um, you know, getting the things, putting stuff together with different levels and sort of you know because there's annoying bats in Antiriad. Um, um, and that's what it sort of put me on. So I, I think if you if this game was in the hands of maybe a year or two later with these ideas, this you know 
lobbing stuff down and climbing up, you know, the characters climbing up, and it was a bit better planned, and you had a, these kind of different elements. I think this could have been... This, was had had the ability to be something really good sort of thing, but it's just it's just I think you're right. It, it, it's it's muted and understated, and 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 I think doesn't sell itself as well as it could do because I think there's there's enough game there. There's more game there than I see in maybe that hyper circuit. There's more going on. There's there's much more different elements to it. Whether it's platforming or you know lobbing things down or collecting stuff or ringing but swinging from bells or jumping over platforms. There's stuff going on, and, and for for a game about you know essentially Quasimodo, it's a, it's a, it's a strange one, but um, I, I I enjoyed it. So it was all right. Yeah, it, it, I'm not saying it's not enjoyable. It is, but my main issue is the game is like, if you're going to make an arcade game of this type, it needs to feel a little bit more frantic. Um, there needs to be a little bit more fr- no, even if when you start that level up with the bells if the bell ropes were swinging when you start so there's a little bit of inertia in there already and just it's silly things like that where the game just feels a little bit static that's why uh, I don't it, think it's an arcade game I would dis- that's why I disagree I, th- I think that's why I said more like Anteriad Anteriad's not an arcade game and I think this is more of that multi-screen sort of uh, almost arcade adventure style thing that it's going for I think it's it. you know Take a step back and and, and look. You know, it, I don't. You know, Hunchback was an arcade game because it's that single screen, sing, simple, repetitive thing over and over again. This is doing different things that I don't think would work in an arcade. I think you'd get frustrated. I don't know what's going on on a home computer. You you know, different things happening. You would be like, okay, I learned this bit, move on to the next bit. Learn this bit, move on to the next bit. I don't know. Um, it was better than I thought it was going to be. Yes, yes. I did dread that it was going to be this awful thing. And it was better than that. It just, I just think it was just, it just needed a bit more life for me. Yeah, a little and, bit more and, life and, to and it. that I absolutely do agree. I think, like I said, better developer, a better uh, someone, and that's no disrespect to the person who made it sort of thing, because what they made is actually, you know, one person yeah, yeah, is, is totally decent good. enough. But I think, you know, in people like, you know, Richard Joseph and, and, you know, with his music on it sort of thing. I could see this just being a palace game in yes. the style of Cauldron. In the style of Cauldron. If you imagine this with Cauldron's visuals and aesthetic and... Well, yeah, and, it's and, not and, far and off. No, it's, it's got... Like, it lacks the high-res sprightiness of the later palace games like Cauldron 2 and things like that. But I totally get where you're coming from. It has that vibe. It does. It does have that. So it was a pleasant, pleasant surprise sort of thing. That, that, but I, I, I get what you're saying about it. It, it needs oomph. Yeah, I think it just perhaps it doesn't quite go, know where it's going. I think you know, it, it, is it is it a hunchback hunchback game? Or are you going to go down the kind of cauldron cauldron two type explorer game? Had it been that, I think it would have been a lot more successful. But there you go. All right. So our last one for this part. Our last one is BC Two Grog's Revenge. Yeah. Great. So, what did you think of this? So, the premise of this game is, and you'll have to excuse me because I never really played BC's Quest for Tires, that alone BC's Quest for Tires Part Two or whatever. <laughs> Did um, no. But you know, this is this is my take. I'm a caveman on a unicycle <laughs> trying to find my way up a mountain um, to collect stuff. That was my basic idea of what I had to do. I thought it was weird which I quite liked because it was weird. The graphics are really cool for its time. It's got some really creative ideas around gameplay. You go in the caves, you get a different viewpoint, and you sort of... It's the first time I've ever played a game with a unicycling caveman of any type. I just didn't quite know what I was really doing. I thought it's got... It felt like it was lots of component parts that fit together in some way that I didn't quite get that was ended for me when I just got shouted at by a monster that just shouted the word (laughs) frog. Yes. And that was the end of the game. That's and what I thought, to I, me. I don't quite know what I'm doing wrong or right. Um, I wasn't sure if I was going up or down the mountain. And I just I just wasn't sure what it was about. I, it felt like it was probably really good, but I didn't quite get to that point. I'm not sure what it was about. So it was fun in its own kind of really weird logic. But it also, it had that, I couldn't help but feel in the back of my mind, it had a little bit of, a bit like Everyone's a Wally, where some character that somebody had drawn up, had, they'd had this perception that it was this much-loved big character that everyone really liked. So throw whatever that character's called, you know, whatever he is, Caveman, Trog, whatever he is, throw him into a game, call it Quest 2, you know, and put some weird stuff around it. You know, everyone loves that kind of stuff. And 
I never played the first one, so I don't know if it's a logical progression. And, you know, I wasn't sat there in 1985 outside the game shop, eagerly waiting for BC's Quest for Tires 2 to launch. It had a little bit of um, Monty Python-y vibe about it, I have to say, which I don't know if that's really a good... You know, and don't get me wrong, something wrong with Monty Python, but it didn't have the off-the-wallness of a Monty Python game and or anything like, so it just kind of borrowed its, you know, lo- its iconography, really, in some weird way from the life of Brian, so I don't know. Um, I didn't quite know what to make of it, really. I didn't quite get it, but it certainly... It wasn't offensive, but I didn't know what I was doing, and like I say, my, my entire adventure ended with the word grog for some reason, and that was that, so I don't know. What did you think? Um, very similar. Um... Nice, nice big graphics. They are full of character. Um, they, they are, you know, it's well animated. There's some nice slapstick, you know, splatting off, you know, dropping off the side of the mountain or going into the walls or whatever sort of thing. So, you know, th- those kind of things are fun. Uh, the caves are nice with the top down and the, the sort of flashlight view. I thought that was quite nice. I didn't know what I was picking up. Yeah. I was picking up things off the floor um, that were worth a certain point. There was a bridge that said I needed 100 to cross. Every time I tried to cross it, I fell off the mountain. Um, so I wasn't quite sure what I'd done wrong. Um, then I, I realized I could go around the back of the mountain, so I did that. Um, and then I got jumped on by a big hairy thing, Captain Caveman type character, uh, who shouted grog at me and my game ended. Uh, yeah, uh, I guess that was grog's revenge. I'd done something. Yeah. <laughs> so uh, <laughs> that was probably grog that was jumping on me and, and shouting his name at me. Um, I'd, I'd, I'm not sure what I'd done to deserve such an end. Um, and yeah, it's, uh, I did think the controls were, it, you've got a very small area of movement and you move quite fast. Um, and the, you, trying to get, you know, lined up with stuff on the floor while not hitting the, f- the wall or not falling off was very twitchy. Um, so I, I, I thought it, you know, it was, it was incredibly twitchy movement. Um, I think I'm the same as you. It's one of those games that I think is, uh, it's thought more of that the character is more popular than, than it actually is. Um, I mean, because even back in the day, I was aware of the games, but I had no affinity for them. And me, you know, this might probably might have been right up my alley back in 1985, but I never, never warmed to it. I found it just a bit try too hard. I yeah. don't know. No, completely agree. Just it was just. A, I think you're right. Another one of those games where, you know, it just felt, I, whatever they were trying to make me part of, I just didn't feel like I was part of it. So I didn't buy into the characters. I didn't buy into any of the you know weirdness about it. It didn't feel like much fun. It was quirky, but you no, know, it was never going to hold my interest. Not when you know it certainly just wasn't my type of game. Um, I like off the world silly games, but this was just kind of stupid and uh, just felt that way. And I thought, you know what? You no, know, I'm I'm a, I'm not sure who it would appeal to. There must be somebody out there that likes it, but it certainly isn't me. It reminded me of it, I I'm, I'm not sure if it is sort of thing, but this it, it put me in the mind that this this could very well be like and i don't know if it is it probably isn't but uh, like a, a mad character yeah like mad, mad magazine like yeah some some american um cartoon character that yes is a, it's got thing that we never got over here um that hadn't and we had no sort of identity with you know and, and was like okay but then or if it wasn't it was trying to be that um i, I don't know it it, it is pfft. You know, no, I quite agree. It looks not, it, uh, best. I can say it. It looks very nice. It does look very nice. Um, there it is full of character, but it's not full of gameplay. And no, you know, just unicycling along a mountain path. <laughs> it's, it, novelty of that's going to wear off pretty quick, regardless of how you do it. So, yeah, 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 yeah. No, no to Grog Revenge. No, no. Right, so that's part two. That's uh, that's more in our usual uh, wheelhouse of uh, terrible games. <laughs> After yes. a positive part, we one. try to find the good ones. We do, we do, but they're, they're f- oh, so far few in between. Maybe they we are spread at this them stage, out. Aren't they? Goodness uh, me! Yeah. Right. So we'll, we'll take a break. We'll come back. Um, we'll be looking at uh, the the media, so films, TV in the UK, uh, music uh, in 1985. So see you in a bit.
Okay, welcome back. This is uh, media, media, general media, films, TV, music in 1985, June 1985, to be precise. Um, we'll look at TV first. Um, <laughs> I think similarly, I think just did, did the world just stop in 1985 <laughs> in June? Because it's like, thinking, yes. <laughs> like, you remember, like, this was what I got. This isn't me cherry picking this. This is all I could find. Um, the 5th of June, the first episode of Bullman is. What the, f- what the hell's Bullman? What was Bullman? I don't know. It's Bullman was spelled with one L. It sounds like, you know, it's someone's name. Who's Bullman? It sounds like a Who, why, pub landlord or something like that. <laughs> why, why is that worthy of note? I've never heard of Bullman. <laughs> no, never heard of um, what channel was it so, on? I don't know. I've no idea. I didn't even. I can't even bother to look it up. I was so annoyed by the sort of name Bullman. <laughs> it just sounds like a crap rubbish. It sounds um, crazy. What is it? Like, who cares? Um, and then the next big news, 12th of June, David Dundas, who composed the Channel 4 theme, wins a legal battle to retain all rights to the music and a thousand pound a week in royalties. <laughs> what? There's nothing going on this month. <laughs> nothing. Um, and on 21st of June, Channel 4 is Europe in concert. Oh, my God. Um, a three and a half hour sequence of classical performances presented by Peter Sisson. Oh, God. That's it. That's your TV highlights for June 1985. <laughs> yeah. Whenever you complain that you're surfing Netflix and can't find anything, yeah, just, think, just think that your highlight of your month could be the, a, new ser- a new episode of Bullman. Well, just think, I mean, it's either you're either watching Bullman at the beginning of that month or by the time you get to the longest day of the year, they decide to put on a three and a half hour classical performance. You're like, oh, my Who's going? No, the thing is, people are going to be out. I think so. No one's watching that, are they? Let's be honest. No, no, they are <laughs> and not. with good cause. <laughs> and with good cause. Um, God, just dry. Uh, what a dry month June was. Uh, what do we get? So music. Where our, our new singles? Um, we'll go for our new singles first, sort of thing. We had "Crazy for You" from Madonna. Okay, which was which came out? Did, this, like, did that come out before or after? Like a Virgin album. I remember hearing after the album in the UK, but still. You, I'm, t- I'm, t- I'm trying <laughs> to song. think, when, when did I get my first walk? Because I had like a version of my first Walkman. I remember listening to it. That must have been around the same time. I c- can't remember. Um, you know, early Madonna. It's all right. Crazy for yes. you. I quite like that track. Yeah, it's um, good. All good. F- Find Young Cannibals with Johnny Come Home. <laughs> they used to crap me. Used to, I, never, I never liked the Find Young Cannibals, and I really hated that song. But it did used to make me laugh. For some reason, I can't explain just the way he kind of sang it. It's just like, Johnny, we're sorry. <laughs> just for some reason, he used to crack me up. Johnny. <laughs> yeah. We're sorry. Won't you come on home? <laughs> we're worried. Yeah. It's like, all right, we get it. All right, you're kind of worried about Johnny. Just go home. Whatever you're doing. Uh, we had Life in One Day by Howard Jones. Yeah, I think, I don't that's, know. Hum- that's hummable and memorable. No. Is it? I, I no, don't remember it all. Not, Were you a Howard Jones odd. fan? Uh, some tracks I like by Howard Jones, yes, but not that one because I don't remember not that it at one. all. Um, there must be an angel. You read mix, yeah. That's, that's a off, good track. I think that's off the second or third album. Second, maybe either way, it's a great track. To be fair to them, it is a good, yeah. it is a good song. That sort of thing. So these these actual singles did come out this uh, in this month. Um, strange enough, I did, did just want to mention this sort of thing. Axel F uh, re- and, and and re-entered the charts in May at number eighty seven, and then by the end of June had climbed to number two. Why? Um, I don't know because Beverly Hills Cop came out in like January. Did Beverly Hills Cop <laughs> Two come out at all? Or was that? Was well, there no, a sequel, Be- no, Beverly Hills Cop Two was a couple of years later. We had Beverly Hills Cop in I think, January, mysterious. February eighty five. Unless Beverly Hills Cop was still running and people, you know, had, had, because it wasn't out on video. This was at the cinema, Beverly Hills Cop. So I don't know, but you know, I found it weird sort of thing that, and I, it was quite interesting when I saw it was at number two. I tra- tra- traced it back through the weeks. <laughs> And it ent- re-entered the charts in like mid-May, and went from eighty-seven to sixty something to forty something to thirty to like, teens, and then just all the way up. It just kept climbing. People, people were really into their, you know, their do 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 do. do. They were really into it. The irony of it is that back then, Top of the Pops was the TV show about music, right? And they hated these kind of songs because if it was number one or even if it was high up in the chart, they had to then play it. And at that time, it was either some kind of perfunctory crappy video or you got the studio audience just dancing and nobody can dance really well to Axel F. <laughs> it's just, tried. It, it's just, is that a, is that a dancey track? It's kind of 
it's a TV, sorry, it's a film theme, and it get, I get it for that. But if you're going to play that, you know, that kind of ding, 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 ding. It's not, a, you know, it, it's not BPM friendly, that, you know, people are gonna not going to want to body pop to it. It's not quite break beat enough. It's too slow. So it's just going to be one of those awkward times on top of the pops. You could probably go on YouTube and find that I time imagine. they played it. It'd be up there yeah. again. 19 is another one, you know, when 19, because it was number one for weeks, you know, out before they had the video such as it was, which was kind of edited library footage at the best of the Vietnam War. Um, prior to that, you know, it was just people in the studio kind of bopping away to 19, you know. And it's just weird to think that they're playing that, all oh, those who remember the war. And they're kind of like, yeah. <laughs> they're bopping away and they're like, no, it ain't good. So uh, I never really liked, Axelf was all right as a film theme but it was it was it did it, it was some quite famous guy Harold Faltermeyer so it was the same guy that did um he did quite a few at that time then um and yeah and so to 19 continued to be number one oh uh, it was number one for most of May it continued into uh June uh where it was then replaced <clears throat> by you'll never walk alone which I thought upon reading that sort of thing was actually a song about the high of Liverpool it was a charity song um in, in the band-aid style sort of thing and that kind of thing um by various celebrities and musicians uh, called The Crowd. Now, I thought You'll Never Walk Alone, for those who don't know, is, is a song that's particularly uh, affiliated with Liverpool Football Club. Liverpool Football Club had been involved in the High School Stadium Fest, but this is actually was actually in aid of the Bradford Fire. Um, so that's what it was. Now, obviously with Band-Aid, we had a lot of stars, a lot of people involved, you know, a lot of very, very well-known people. The Crowd... Consisted of Bruce Forsyth, okay. Denny Lane, Who? Jim Diamond, oh, right. Tony Christie, John Conte, right, a boxer, okay. the Baron Knights, okay, Kiki D, Rolf Harris, oh dear, Kenny Lynch, good does uh, me, Keith Chegwin, oh dear, uh, I'm just reading these out, uh, Johnny Logan, Zach Starkey, Black Lace, oh my god. Uh, the Nolans, John Entwistle of the Who, Motorhead, <laughs> which I thought was what? weird, Dave Lee Travis, <laughs> Ed Stewart. Wait, 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 slow down there, Ace. Motorhead. Mo- Motorhead and Black Lace <laughs> in the same band. Hang on, hang on, because coming up next is two names you're never going to hear together. There's Ed Stewart right, and Phil, and Phil Linnett. <laughs> what? <laughs> and then someone called Smokey, whoever that is. Joe Fagan. Right. Eddie Hardin. Um, yeah, Bernie Winters. <laughs> oh, dear. We know bits in there as well. I don't know. So there were other people as well, but they were contributing musicians and celebrities um, for the And it, well, obviously, I'm not knocking it. It's for, it was no, for, no, because it was for people, and, victims of the, no. of the Bradford thing. But it, that, that, that collaboration of talent... Yes, is, is is one of the weirdest things I've ever, <laughs> ever, ever. When I looked at this, I was just I thought, oh, well, oh okay, I don't remember the crowd who was in it. Oh, it's just the wow, idea. That's of that's a, that's Bernie a strange. Winters. The Nolans and Motorhead. The Nolans and Motorhead stood next to Bernie Winters and Phil <laughs> in it. Yeah, just like how just, often does that happen? You know, and which means that probably the unsung musicians in there. I mean, that who's the famous guitarist in Phil Linnett's band? Was it Stevie Ray Vaughan? Oh, I don't know. I so, don't know. It's, imagine it's, some, it's, it's, thin, just, it's thin Lizzy, isn't it? Yeah, exactly. So it's just, it's just. It, well, I mean, amazing that they would come together and do something for charity like that. I, I, I can't imagine what it sounds like. And uh, well, I don't, it's, it's, it's going to be you. It's going to be you. Never walk alone. I mean, you can't really go wrong with you. Never yeah, walk alone. Yeah, but I, mean, I just, <laughs> just don't know how they would. I, think, I can't imagine the mix where. There's any the the, the the frequency range between Lemmy <laughs> and you know somebody like Bernie Winters or somebody else is just so bizarre I can't get my head around it. I don't know. No, but it, I tell you what, as far as charity singles go, it's still got to be better than the remake of um, Band Aid. They know it's Christmas, yeah, 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 because yeah. that, that, that lives in memory as the worst charity record of all time. Yeah, so, it's not good. It's awful. <laughs> Don't and knock. We never. We we, we never knock the uh, no, sentiment. No, not knocking the efforts of the charities that in the cause. We're not knocking the cause, but you but know, it's perfectly fine next, to knock. Next the end time product. someone says to all those celebrities, "Do you fancy releasing a single?" Or would you rather chip in five hundred quid each? Chip in five hundred <laughs> quid each. <laughs> it's probably best. Yeah. 
But the crowd lasted a couple of weeks at number one, um, and then we got a bit bored, um, and the UK got then put Frankie by Sister Sledge at number one. So there you go. There's there's music. So films, um, films. We have uh, uh, movies. The big one, I think, this month uh, <laughs> is Roger Moore's Brown Coat Adventure. So- <laughs> <laughs> uh, if if any of our listeners can guess what that is, uh, that is uh, otherwise known as uh, Duran Duran's A View to a Kill. <laughs> So awful. <laughs> I hate that movie so much. Even it's, by Roger Moore movies and Bond movies. It the is, thing is utter it, garbage. Even, even by the 80s standards of like, you know, questionable um, celebrities and what we found out about them doing dubious things sort of thing. The fact of like Roger Moore and what's what's her name? Is it Tanya someone? Yeah. Um, it's got it, she's a, she's a, she's, she's, she, no, no, I'm not about the, the, the blonde, the, the blonde oh, girl and the, the woman and sort of thing. Tan, it's Tanya, I think it's Tanya something or other. Um, Tanya she's, Hyde. she's young, she's young, young enough to be his granddaughter. Um, it's, it's awful. It's, it's so bad. Uh, Patrick McNee plays a terrible, terrible part. Christopher Walken is the only vaguely redeeming thing. Uh, Max, <laughs> that bloody scientist. <laughs> Max, I was it's, it's, it's awful. <laughs> oh, it's such a bad film. It is. I mean, it is. It's the, the last one for Roger Moore sort of thing. It's not a. It's not. A, it's not gone out on a high. He's really not. You got. To, you got to at least try your James Bond uh, Roger Moore voice. <laughs> I haven't to, got one. My, my voice isn't deep enough. You've got to go uh, shaken, not stirred. <laughs> shake. <laughs> no, I can't do it. I can't do like that. You said bacon, bacon, <laughs> not fried. <laughs> so, a view to a kill came out in June, and it's uh, bloody uh, shite. Is it, I mean, it, it, essentially, a view to a kill pretty much killed the Bond. Yes, uh, killed the killed the Bond franchise until Goldeneye. Yes, it did. Was yeah. there another one? Oh no, we had Living Daylights. We're sorry, we had Timothy Dalton, didn't we? Yeah, yeah, but that oh, Timothy so, Dalton. Okay, so we had, so we had license to kill, it, yeah. license to kill, Living Daylights, and and after that sort of thing. But but View to a Kill was you know an adventure too far for Roger Moore. <laughs> so it was just so bad. So um, shit. It, <laughs> I hate that film so much. Yeah, it's 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 just it's, old. It's just James Bond shouldn't be that old, and it's just no. like a pensioner going around going hello and zipping <laughs> net dresses. It's like it's just rancid. And I imagine all the women in it felt that way. Don't get me wrong. I'm sure Roger Moore's a lovely, lovely guy. Was a lovely guy. He's a lovely guy. I don't know if he's still alive, but I'm sure he was an amazing person. But you, you know, you're watching you know, some nubile 25 year old woman getting their dress unzipped by a pensioner. He's no one, no fun for anybody. The camera crew are probably like, ah, oh, God, no, his his fingers are like dust. <laughs> no, make it stop. <laughs> Yeah, uh, dust. The makeup held his face together. <laughs> There's so much powder on him. He's more powder than man. <laughs> Nightmare. Well, he, that's why he had that brown jacket on all the time, because he un- unzipped it, he just collapsed. <laughs> he just fell apart. He did. Like old bones. There's nothing in there. You unzip it, it's just nothing. It's just dust in air. It's just it's just the memory of Bond's past. <laughs> <laughs> Far past your head. Horrific. Yeah, View to a Kill is, is a bad James Bond film. I mean, there are some bad James Bond films, but I think that's. I don't know. I mean, I'd r- rather watch Moonraker over that. Moonraker has its problems too, <laughs> but I'd rather watch it over View to a Kill. I think the, the the other James. I mean, the other Roger Moore ones. What you got? You got Man with the Golden Gun, Spy Love Me, uh, Live and Let Die, uh, Oct- Octopussy. Is that the one you're thinking of? Yeah. I don't like it. I don't. Uh, uh, That's the, the big chase after right. an egg, that one. <laughs> <laughs> oh, give me an egg. <laughs> <laughs> they're, they're all crazy over that golden egg in that one. And well, it's, it's, it's egg and, it's egg and uh, nuclear weapons, isn't it? Well, it diffuses a bomb on a tray and it does the classic Bondy stuff, you know, and all that. I suppose it's all right, but it's just got stupid characters in Octopussy that annoy me. That's my little Octopussy. It's the guy who dies from being grabbed by an octopus on the face. It's like, ah! <laughs> octopus grabs him. It's like, just take it off. It's an octopus. It's not like it's going to... It won't kill you, really. The worst it no. can do is squirt ink on your face. It's not, it's not like it's, it's been taken over by an egg from Alien. It's a fish. He's attacked by a fish. <laughs> and it's not a particularly deadly fish, as far as I'm aware. Certainly not that scale. If it was a man-sized one that grabbed him, maybe. But it's just, you know, no. 
You know, but she does say at some point it's the most poisonous, deadliest octopus in the world. I'm like, right, okay, of course it is. Yeah, and you have one in a tank. Yeah, that's what you do with them. Yeah. The anyway. other film that came out this month, and there were only two, according to what I could find. Uh, correct me if I'm wrong. I don't know, but the only one I could find out that came out the cinema this month because <clears throat> it's impossible to find any information on what came out on video was uh, Runaway. Ha! See, now I watched this two weeks ago. Ah, you can tell us. I, I, so, I have fond memories of it. I think it was all right. It, it's killer, a cl- killer robot it's a good spiders. Film. Yeah. Totally, it's a clever film. This is about a policeman in a in the future. Is Tom Selleck plays a policeman, gets a new partner, and these uh, his job is to investigate uh, essentially um, robot crimes. And these robots in this film are kind of perfunctory um, servants and things like that that have kind of those kind of roles. And if they go rogue, which in the context of this means that for some reason all robots that carry things around just go completely rogue and have lasers that they can shoot at people. Let's just go with that. So uh, his job as a policeman is to go and stop them from being runaways, runaway robots. Enter uh, Gene Simmons' evil character, who's created this deadly chip that makes these robots even more deadly than usual. He wants to replicate that, and then it's all a bit of espionage about um, how whether the, Tom, the sort of cat and mouse chase with Tom Selleck look, trying to find the guy that's got these deadly chips. He's got these kind of heat-seeking bullets. He's kind of super tech-savvy plays the part so hammy that it's beyond belief he may as well just walk around with ham hanging off his face but <laughs> at the same time there's a there's a nice quality to this film it's got a really weird soundtrack but it's actually quite a um it's a film again of its time but there's some really nice ideas the little killer robot spiders that inject acid and explode and there's little hints and tips it's badly cut in the uk um when it's on shown on tv which i don't think it ever will be again but um but it was uh, badly cut in the UK when it was shown. However, the Blu-ray is fully restored, for want of a better word. It's actually pretty good. And um, there's some really nice bits. But t- Gene Simmons is there easily because he's kiss, isn't it? And you know, and, but he he does he looks kind of evil in this in a kind of crazy way. He plays it so, you know, deadly serious but stupid at the same time. And I quite like it about that. And Tom Selleck, he's always watchable in things he's in. He's always, he plays. It's always him. He always plays Tom Selleck, so it's kind of watching Magnum P.I. in a robot film. But, you know, and there is a moment in this film where he picks a woman's nose in a moment of endearing passion. <laughs> and I always think that that's, that scene, and if you watch it for no other reason to watch that moment where Tom Selleck shows his passion for someone by picking their nose, it's worth it just for that. So, yes, run away. Um, Runaway, View to Kill, View to Kill, Terrible, Runaway, Good. Um, Strange months, uh, dull music, dull TV, well, not dull music, music was all right, but dull TV. I mean, don't don't moan when you've got the entirety of Netflix and Disney Plus and Amazon to scroll through. Um, You know, you could be watching Bullman. Um, So, yeah, so on that note, there we go. That was the media uh, in June 1985. Um, Don't blame us. And we're back for our final part. So our final few games. Uh, we've got one, two, three, four, five, six, seven. Oh, God, we've got seven still to do. Um, <clears throat> but these are uh, some are ugly, some brr, uh, most are ugly, actually. Um, so let's get on with these. Um, these didn't review, review as well. So we've left the... Uh, <laughs> if you, well, if you, actually, we've already done Talladega, so uh, we've left to not the worst to last. Um, but our first one we're going to look at right now is a game called Big Mac, the Mad Maintenance Man. <clears throat> and so Big Mac, the Mad Maintenance Man. What would you think Big Mac, the Mad Maintenance... Uh, I've got that title. I'm just going to call it Big Mac. Um, is it about burgers? Is it, a, is it a riff on Burger Time? You know, Mr. Wimpy? No. No, it's not. It is essentially a, a, a puzzle platformer. Um, uh and okay, so basically, you play these quite—it's uh, it, not terrible animation, but an, a little animated guy who, who has to jump around various little stages, turning switches off and on to allow him to progress through the single screen stage to get to the house at the end and progress to the next screen. <clears throat> That's it, really. There are some, you know, uh, electric force fields. There are little enemies moving about, Manic Miner style at, at times, and so you avoid them. Um, the switches, you, if you, you can turn them off and on, 
um, and mostly you want to turn them off to allow you to progress. Um, and, and that's it, really. Um, the visuals are a bit dated. They're, you know, for 1985, when we look at something like uh, Super Pipeline 2 um, and, you know, uh, Hyper Circuit uh, and other games of this, you know, that around at the time, sort of thing, these are very much visuals that would probably look, not look out of date in 1983, 84. They're a bit dated. Uh, the, the soundtrack is, is annoying. Um, but this is not a bad puzzle platformer. The actual core mechanic of figuring out the switches to turn off and how to, and, and the controls that when you master that jumping backwards over the switches to turn it back on and get around them is, is, is actually okay. This, if you take out the parts, there are a couple of bits where I got stuck in a level which should never happen, and so you know I, I couldn't progress and whatever. Um, and if you take out the lives, and, and if you redid this mechanically with some nice soft visual, this could actually work today. This is not a bad game because it's essentially it's, it's a, you know it's, it's a puzzles. It's a series of puzzle screens rather than a platformer. And in that respect, I think it works quite well. I was I, I when I first looked at this, I thought, oh god, this looks awful. But as I played more of it, I, I sort of realized what it was trying to do, which was not be, it wasn't Manic Miner. It wasn't what it looked like. It was something else. And I think behind it, it, that's kind of hidden. But when you dig into it, yeah, this was all right. This was surprisingly all right. I thought it was just another Manic Miner clone. Um, I don't like those kind of platform games. They're all said and done. I don't I dislike them. I just find them frustratingly hard. Um, I don't have the perseverance to want to explore them further than their initial screen. So it felt just like another one of those. It was graphically okay. It wasn't anything bad or too bad or anything like that. Like you say, it had its merit, merits, relative merits. But for me, I've just I've seen it a million times before. Um, and it had offered nothing that those other ones offered me. And they don't offer me the kind of gameplay I really enjoy. So I just I, I thought, yeah, it's okay. But it's not for me, this kind of game. So... Um, but they do have appeal for those people that like them. Though. I, I get that because it does. It really does look like Jet Set Willy, Manic Miner, Bounty Bob, uh, Manic Miner 2049. It looks like all those, but <clears throat> the structure of the levels is, is very different because you, you control the progress. So it's, it's like a, it's a puzzle game. It's more like something like Montezuma's Revenge or something like that. Um, um, or what's the other one? Uh, there was another one. Uh, what was it? Solomon's, Solomon's Mines. Um, it, 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 it's more about that single screen puzzle, whereas Manic Miner was just, you know, jump for the platforms, collect the objects, get to the end. That was it. This is more about, okay, I have to figure out which switch do I turn on to allow me to get to that next switch to figure out, okay, then I need to get over there and then I need to do this bit and I need to go down there and fall off that. And there was, there was planning here. There was a, there was a, there was a route. There was, there was depth here that I wasn't, that I didn't see at first. Um, and I get, yeah. And I think that's what I, my, my, I, my comment has put dated visuals and annoying sidetrack hide a decent puzzle platformer. And I think it, it, with some more interesting visual touches and a more and clearer communication of what you had to do, I think you know you, you can. I think this could be something quite interesting. There's there's an interesting mechanic here um, of turning switches off and on um, and trying to figure out you know what switches I need to turn on to turn off to which bit to get through to you know. And that's that's not a bad mechanic. Um, <clears throat> And so there is something here. It's not brilliant. I'm not saying it's like I'm, you know, it's going to set the world on fire or anything. But I think there's there's, there's more to this than just a, a manic minor clone, which is what it. And I agree. I agree completely. It does look like that at first. Yeah, it, I mean, it, it it's got that kind of thematic. Um, it's 18 screens, believe it or not, big. This game. So there is those individual challenges, and that is quite of interesting. What's perhaps most important about this game, aside from the fact that, yes, it's a derivative game, the game was £1.99 at the time in Mastertronic's range. Now, that sets it apart from the others because it represents much better value. It might not be original, but in terms of value for money, for a £1.99 game, you're getting a lot, quite a bit of bang for your buck there and quite a lot of complexity. So in that sense, it's it's okay. It's just it's quite derivative. But no, Mastertronic made a, a pretty much... A, um, a whole slew of games that were derivative um, so um, it fits in keeping with their MO and of course some of those early Mastertronic games were actually made by the Darling Brothers 
um, those uh, so the lot of those early 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 Mastertronic games were all behind the scenes with the Darling Brothers. So it was Codemasters, really. And of course, that, we all know where that went. So, so I don't know if this specific one was, but um, I say uh, you, you either like these kind of games or you don't. And I find them a little bit they're fiddly, aren't they? They're, and frustrating. I, I know it, Doesn't I, mean they're bad games. <coughs> yeah, they're just fiddly. Not, not, not quite my cup of tea, but you know, not terrible. Yeah, I know what you mean. For for two quid, this this was. I think you know this would have entertained me for quite a while, sort of thing. And I, like I said, sort of thing. It was. It it, it had a, a certain. It had a little bit more thought than just navigating um, the level itself. Um, and I thought that was uh, interesting. But. It is, you know, it's not like I said, not going to set the world on fire, but as a mechanic, I think there's, you know, switch, you know, figuring out which switches in a in a sequence to turn on and off, and navigating a, a, a you know, a, a, a platforming maze can be enjoyable. Absolutely, and, and that's and in what it is. Of, in, when you compare this side by side with some of those other Mastertronic games, and this is a positive gold blockbuster because some of those other ones are awful for what, whether one ninety nine or not, they're terrible. So. Compared to those, you know, this it might not be great, but it's better than some of the other rubbish they produce. So, yeah. So, Big Mac, I, I enjoyed it. I can get why, if you know, if, if this isn't doesn't like your boat, this manic miner style platformer, you're probably not going to adhere to it. But yeah, I, there's there's some in there anyway. Um, let's move on then. So, from Big Mac, the Mac maintenance man, we go to <clears throat> uh, Q Music, I guess. Uh, Dam Busters. It's it's got a great there's a great thematic and tone to this game and it has a nice feel so it's kind of a crossover f- I want to say fighting but what I mean is it's kind of got a simulator but it's also a little bit of drop the bomb at the right time and do that kind of stuff and there's some good sound effects in it and stuff like that but at the end of the day you don't have to do a lot until the time comes it's pretty dull and I have that argument with many games of this type so it's not alone um, and there's a game that comes much later in the C64 um, history, which we'll cover later, which is Ace of Aces, which does this kind of stuff a lot better, uh, even better at capturing that kind of vibe and that feel of time. So I didn't get the feel that I was in a giant plane I, of any kind. I don't like flight simulators on 8 bits. I just don't think it works for me at all And simulators. So where there is alternative screens and you can look at the dials and the things, that's all great. you know. And for somebody that has a nostalgic feel about looking at no, dials of an old airplane. <laughs> I'm sure it's probably manna from heaven. But for me, um, no, I'd rather be, you know, give me Black uh, Black Hawk or a game like that where I'm, you know, even that point of view where I'm just dropping lots of bombs arbitrarily and that kind of advent. I'm a, more of an arcade feel. This has the kind of, you know, you've got to wait, you've got to wait and pace yourself with this game. It's, you've got to fly, apart from else, fly to the dams and drop the bombs at the right time. And there's a strat- strategy and a pace to it which just doesn't suit my kind of gameplay in in the slightest. So it's not terrible, but it's certainly not a game for me. Um, and I just thought it was, you know, challenged. Ooh, I think we've lost you again. Oh, no, I thought we'd lost you again for a minute. So I think the game had um, challenges, um, but not challenges that I would want to ever repeatedly play so for me i sort of looked at it and thought well there's some nice elements to that but nah not for me um i couldn't get on with this all sort of thing that i flicked from screen to screen yellow dots moved around in certain ways there were some enemies came towards me or flew away from me i tried to shoot it didn't matter it seemed to matter which where i picked to land or take off or do whatever secrets i did it was all at night and dark i couldn't figure out whether i was flying or thinking i seemed to miss my target all the time and then fly off and then crash into the ground. Not for me. No, no, really, really, just no. I, I, ugh. I, 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 I struggle with these type of games. I know they're not for me, so I'm not going to, you know, knock them too much. It's not, you know, but I do like, you know, like you said, I think Ace of Aces, um, uh, Desert Fox. Um, there are examples of these kind of, you know, historical sort of arcade sims that work well sort of thing this did not do that for me um and i just thought it was just like and i think like you said sort of thing it's all predicated on like dropping that bloody bomb at the right time which you know and then so you have a moment of <gasps> surrounded by 20 minutes of uh, Okay, so our next game is Blagger Goes to Hollywood. Um, 
so Blagga was a was a character that again one of those characters that people seem to think was more popular than they were. They were in a, a few games, if I seem to remember, um, but none of them I particularly liked. And going back to this one, I didn't like this one again. Um, uh, the, the the game starts off with um, what I can only call like a, a some kind of sonic violation um, <laughs> of uh, of, uh, of uh, a, a musical versions of various Hollywood. Hollywood tunes. Um, so, giving you a sort of thing of like, okay, so we're in Hollywood, so it's Black Ghost Hollywood, so here's some tunes. Some, but the, the weird thing is, we get Man with the Golden Gun, Batman, <laughs> the Incredible Hulk, a Robin Hood, uh, and whatever, I don't know. Um, so, the, when the game starts, it's, uh, it's uh, in our favorite viewpoint, which is isometric. Yeah, um, we've already stated our dislike for isometric games, and and this is not going to change that. I'm going to say, um, I, I don't know. I, I wandered up, down, left, right for a bit, and every time I went through some different things, some the the the, the, the bad music would come back to yeah. attack me, um, and some whirling dervish thing would would move around, and then that would turn into the character from that music, and then they would attack me. Uh, I don't know. I was. I can only assume sort of thing that because at one point I, I, I picked something up. Um, I, I was then menaced by Batman, Scaramanga, the Hulk, and Robin Hood <laughs> as I moved from area to area. And then I pressed the button and I, and I threw it away. I, 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 what the hell? What 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 is this? I couldn't. Even, I couldn't begin to understand what you're supposed to do. What the point is? What anything about this was supposed to be other than? just a an awful awful assault on my senses um but my, my final word on this is just simply no <laughs> um it's just it was awful awful um I, I i can imagine that i did actually look at this back in the day because i was aware of the blagger games but i've absolutely wiped every kind of memory of this just wiped it this was just dreadful I don't like isometric games. I don't like really blocky, horrible sprites in isometric games. And um, more to the point, I didn't get and fully buy into all of the blagger stuff. So it, for me, it was, you know, coming at this game from a person that wasn't really aware of what a whole blagger thing was about or anything else. It just felt like a another uh, isometric uh, drawn game that, you're wandering around, not doing much of anything. Um, and I'm sure there's probably puzzles to solve and things to pick up and things to put down and, and all that kind of thing. And you've no doubt. Um, it just didn't have much hold over me. And I found it pretty dull. And the music was just awful. So um, I think it just, it felt like a, a game that was kind of thrown together a bit. Um, I didn't think the graphics were very detailed or they were a bit sort of, blocky and no and it was you know it ran fast i suppose the best you can say about it but you know, if that's all you can say about a game that's meant to be a big adventure an arcade adventure set in movie land as it's described then um it, did, it certainly didn't come over that way for me so i didn't think much to it yeah bad 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 you know but like i said blagger we had a few games there was a few games i recognize the name i think but I, I don't remember ever. I don't know why. I think someone obviously really liked the character um, and, and just kept on making these kind of things. But <laughs> this one was, yeah, no, I, it was. Ugh. I, I, I know. It, I, 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 you know. I don't want to punch down or anything, but this is just bad. It's just, a, just, it, 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 I, yeah, ugh, incomprehensible. I couldn't, couldn't figure out what the hell. I kept going from, you know. I presume it was like, oh, you're going through different zones of Hollywood where there are different themed stars. Yeah, you know, you've got and, to steal things. stuff, essentially. You've got to go around stealing stuff. That's essentially yeah. the mainstay of the game. But pff, not for me. Not for me. No. And I'm presuming not for Just, you either. No, fiddly. I don't... Yeah. <laughs> it seems to be the, the word of the night. The word fiddly. of the night. F fiddly, yeah. <laughs> fiddly, fiddly, yeah. And blocky, on a, on a, blocky graphics. On a night we mentioned Rolf Harris, fiddly. Right, so no, Bye Goes Hollywood's another no. I don't think any of these are going to get yeses, but uh, we'll, we've got a few to go to go. Let's go through with the amazing Glider Pilot. Uh, uh, <laughs> just when you think 
flight simulators can't be made any more boring. <laughs> take out no. the power. Take out the engine. <laughs> no. Why? And what, and what, and what are you? I mean, this is a, a glider is essentially something that you fly in the wind. It's a man manned kite, right? <laughs> so this is a game where you're not even got the excitement of being in it. So what you are looking at is just a big chunk of sky that's either up or not quite as up as the big chunk of green. Um, and you can go slightly left or slightly right. And there's, you know, perfunctory effects. I thought it, I really don't like games like this at all. I have no time and place for them. Um, I have yet to come across one I've liked um, ever, with the exception of Stunt Car Racer, which comes way later down the line. But these kind of flight, actual flight simulators are boring enough without making it about the most boring airplanes <laughs> known to man as well. You know, next on the list is, you know, Kite Simulator for me. You know, it's just, what are they thinking of? And who, who, who is a glider pilot would think the best thing to flying an actual glider <laughs> is to get yourself a Commodore 64 and play that. Because I would argue that unless someone's got a hurricane force wind blowing across your face at the same time, you are not going to get the glidey feeling out of that experience. You're going to get, I, I've been ripped off badly by the shop and the shop assistant who probably told me this was really clever or something. So no, rubbish, absolute rubbish. Yeah, yeah. I think my, my, my comment, I, I, again, let's refer back to my notes. I just wrote, why? Why make this? Yeah, um, yeah. I don't understand. Awful, visually and already awful. It's it's, it's so. It, it, I think it does come back to it begs that question: Why make this? Why why would you sit down at your Commodore sixty four and whoever made this sort of thing? Clearly, I mean, clearly they can program. Clearly, they can do this sort of thing and think. Do you know what? Do you know what will get the kids and the people you know really revved up? Is a really quiet thing where you just glide through the air with not much control and, and no kind of impetus apart from... Because this isn't like, you know, now, if you did f a glider pilot sort of thing, where it would have photorealistic visuals and you could enjoy, like, maybe glider pilot over, like, yeah, you know... VR or something, um, right? Yeah, or, you, you know, you could enjoy going over, you know, the the, the Grand Canyon or, the, the Ven you know, or Venice or any kind of, like, incredible visuals that you could be rendered now. No, this is just green, <laughs> block a block of green that's all you're flying over there's no detail so there's no point to this there's no skill there's, there's no anything it, it, it's, it's, just, it's fundamentally a bad idea from the get-go well i would argue that if you take away all of the elements that make this a dangerous thing to do which this does by being sat in a chair in the safe environment of your bedroom then the only peril that you get is the relative altitude you might otherwise be at, which here is represented by nothing other than a dial. So no, there's no peril in this game, even if you were one foot off the ground. Knowing that you're in a glider, which means that <laughs> chances are you're probably just going to bump into the ground. Um, you know, there's no element of danger to it. You know, and I think you know, not that there should be, but you know. What could you inject into a game about gliders to make it more exciting other than the potential chance of crashing, which you don't do a lot in this. I, I mean, I was trying to crash and I could, really couldn't. So, and I thought, you know, other than aim my airplane, not airplanes, aim my glider at the ground, even then it didn't seem to want to let me crash. It was just kind of like, you know, there'd be warning sounds and bleeps. And and I didn't get, what didn't come over to me was the idea that I was in some kind of race at the time and I could go around and I had to fly around this course in a certain speed and time i didn't get any of that i just kind of like oh i know and the graphics were so awful i just no 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 these clouds uh, these clouds in there but not as we know it so it just you know it just felt like i'm looking at a a temperature gauge for all of them a difference makes like a <laughs> dial that goes up and a dial that goes down and somehow it's related to the things that i do but i'm not sure what so boring boring never make a game about glider piloting ever again um, right, so glider pilot is a big, big, big fat no. Waste no. of time. Never do that. Never make a game no. about that. Um, 
so the, our next couple will do in uh, we'll do it a, a big thing because this was a, a double uh, d- a double cassette release a double double release um and this was even and this was two games so you would think in releasing two games but this is uh, this issue's only tacky so this is the only game that got a tacky review which means it's bloody awful just think that glider pilot blagger dan busters big mac all the others we've said are awful did talladega didn't get tacky these two did um <laughs> yes and strange enough these two came from epics you know, know the home of pits up too the home of summer uh, games this is shocking <laughs> Um, reading the review, this just seemed to be like some old Epics games that they've shoved in a couple, you know, in a compilation and just released and hope that, you know, two for the price of one will make up for the fact like that. But, you know, two turds in your hand is worse than one turd in your hand. Um, and this is literally two turds. The first game is Starfire. Um, <laughs> so some rubbish Star Wars ripoff is the best I can say about it. There's, there's, TIE fighter type ships circling around that you line up and shoot. Yes, periodically interspersed with Death Star like vessels. Yeah. You know, it's, you ripping off, it's just ripping off Star Wars, but not very well at all. In fact, badly. So no. It, rubbish. It's a very it's a very, very bad game. Mechanically visually everything. And then really, you know, this is if this were I'm surprised Epic's got to where they did. <laughs> um, I, I can only imagine something because this must be around the same time they did Pit Stop remember and Pit Stop was awful something happened uh, either they, they hired they went on a hiring frenzy sort of thing and hired a lot of talented people in 1984 <laughs> because that's when we got Summer Games and Pit Stop something happened over Epics yeah. I wonder if they, these people were all in their um they, they'd already they'd quit their previous jobs, but they had to work their notice. So there was like a three month <laughs> gap before they could start at, before they could start at Epic. So this is what you know the people that were there at the time were like, oh, just release any old crap. We've got three months to kill. And release. <laughs> What's that one you were working the other day? That really crap Star Wars v- variant. Oh, Starfire. Just release that. God's sake. Just release, release it. Yeah, just release someone it. will buy it. Yeah, and then the talented people arrive and probably fired all this lot. Because the other game um, is Fire One. So we have Starfire and Fire One. Um, so we have this space game, and then we have Fire One. I, I don't know. Fire. It's so Fire One again. We're, we're talking. You control some some. You, you control a ship this time um, in, in some kind of like really congested shipping lane. Um, <laughs> and, and for so, and, and for some reason, you're shooting all the other ships. I think but, uh, really badly. You can go left or right. I think you could go left or right. There's some kind of dual screen weird mechanic thing. But it, it's my my comment uh, incomprehensible and mechanically violating. <laughs> so that's good. You liked it then. <laughs> I, th- this game annoyed me more than Glider Pilot. This, this was this was frustrating to a point where I was like I was actually angry at this because it was it was it was a travesty, um, and so. Like I said, if I bought these two games thinking, oh, two games, the price of what? Yeah, from Epics. Oh, 1985, they released Pit Stop 2. This is, this is absolutely... They're a sure sign of quality, right? <laughs> yeah, this is... It's some, if I'd have thought Epics, Pit Stop 2, sh- Summer Games, and they've, they've, they, you know, they've put two games in one tape, I'm on for a surefire winner here. <laughs> I would be very angry at, at this if this is... I went home and loaded these games up. Um, I was very angry even booting them up right now. Um, these were awful, awful. Yeah, it felt unfinished. It clearly was. I think um, I just put it was. Based I don't think around, it was started. No, it was. It was based around an arcade sub hunter. I think is what it was called. I think or something or, or periscope. But there was an arcade that was similar, which was ship at the bottom, torpedoes away, and the rest of it. Yeah. But I put it was based around that. Only really horrible. So <laughs> every every, so every, every aspect of that game that was even partway decent was destroyed by this monstrosity. So essentially, somebody at Epics was on the phone to someone who described Star Wars and Sub Hunter to them, and they went off thinking they knew what those games were and made copies of them. Yes. That's essentially what's happened here. Yeah, my feelings, at the end of that conversation, you went, so you got it then, you got what I'm saying. You went, yep, <laughs> yep, 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 totally. Absolutely. <laughs> Absolutely. I, I, can make, I can make these games. And uh turned out you couldn't, whoever that was. I think, um, they, were, yeah. I think they were old games as well. I think they'd been... After yeah, that's what I mean. Yeah, someone had that's found why them I think, on a disc somewhere and was like, oh, release them there, all right. That's why I think this is, th- that's why this really annoys me, sort of thing, because this is being released after these other games, but they were made before them. 
So this is like trading on the the kudos and the goodwill that you know people have played Pit Stop Two and Summer Games had for this you know this software house. This you know for Epics, you know you look at for Epics and you think, wow, Epics have released this dual game. You know they must be great. You don't think, oh, these games are two three years old and they were gra- cra- crap at the time. That's why the, that's why this really annoyed me. This is a this is this is a really bad even at the time sort of cash grab coming on in the back of their other games and, and i think it's a it, it's even now 35 years on i feel angry but can you imagine <laughs> if you'd have how angry you'd have been if you'd have that's paid what I mean. 11 yeah. pound 95 for the disc version of those oh violating the only thing that, that would have been worth having is if you were willing to hack out the vorpal loader which was inevitably on those if they're epic <laughs> and 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 be the person that could crack that which took a long time i have to tell you a long time but um yeah, no, awful. And I uh, Zap's justification. It their, their, their final company is old favourites but new disasters, which made me laugh out loud. When I read that, so <laughs> good, yeah. really good. Yeah, the, the best they could say about it was that it had good instructions. <laughs> <laughs> Brilliant. <laughs> I love, it. I love that. Damning, damning with faint praise. How would you review this game? It's got great instructions. Yeah, it's brilliant instructions. That what's game? <laughs> well, uh... <laughs> and I knew how to play it. <laughs> It's a bit That's crude. the best I can crude, say. Crude graphics. <laughs> oh, awful, awful. All right, let's yep. do our last one. Our last one is S Estra. <clears throat> ah, this was a quirky old thing. Yeah, what did you think to this? Um, it was a collector mall game, wasn't it? You had to run around collecting stuff. It was a bit weird. It took me a while to figure out what I was doing. Yeah, same here um, as well. So um, I spent a while sort of dying a lot, thinking, what what on earth am I doing? I get that with some of these 80s games, though. It's not always immediately obvious what the hell you are, what kind of world you're in, <laughs> what the expectations are. So you just kind of, you know, you die a lot before you figure it out. And, of course, there are, you know, you can get instructions for these, so it probably would have helped to do that. But, the, you know, the whole point of some of these games is that you don't really need the instructions. If you load up Green Beret or Rambo or Commando, you don't need the instructions. You know really what you've got to do from the first two seconds of play. So when a game starts where it's like a block and you've got blocks around you and there's a block in the middle and you're flying around and you're <laughs> dying, you're dying. Like what, what relevance, you know, what am I to, in this context of this world, what am I doing? What have I got to do? And then, it, so it took me a while. And then when I did finally get to the part where I was doing the thing I'm supposed to do, I was like, eh. <laughs> yeah, you're building up that picture of that thing in the middle, aren't you? So you, you you're getting you're getting so that so the game is a single screen, and around around the edge of the screen, there's like all these sort of circles. I mean, in between the circles are, are little squares. I guess is the best thing, little yellow squares. And in the middle of the screen, there's a a broken square, so sort of, you know, with gaps in the top middle right and left sort of thing and you're a, a smaller square in the middle of that that you can move and you can move out um there are these diamonds moving around the screen erratically and a weird semicircle for some reason that i can't quite figure out going to anything will kill you apart from the yellow dots in between the circles at the top and then you bring them back to the middle only one at a time if you go into another one once you collect one you die um, and then essentially each time you bring one back it builds up a picture in the middle um, when you do start to collect them though the circles in the middle will start to move towards your towards your base and if they get to the base you die uh, so you have to hit them um, so it's yeah it's it's, just, it's a strange once you figure all out it's like, okay oh yeah it's okay but yeah fiddly again I think fiddly um, reminded me of um, in the same kind of genre of kicks, volfide, um, that kind of move to the edge, you know, around the edge of the screen, that kind of things moving around that you don't want to hit, that, that, that sort of thing. It's all right. It was, it was okay. One, it's, I put too punishing to be enjoyable. Um, yes, I would was, agree. Was a, was a comment. It's it's it. There's too many ways to die. <laughs> it's like give me a freaking break. Um, you know. Um, and and I think that was its main issue. It's it's just too punishing. It's like, the, you know, you don't kill me for just a, the pixel perfect collision on the on the edges of the square and things like that. Just yeah, um, it is. And uh, for you know, it's it's to be fair, it's better than probably most ones we've just reviewed, just looked at. Um, but again, it's it's not terrible. It's just punishing. It it really is. And you know, you 
it, it's quite a nice idea, but I think I think your your sound <laughs> summed it up a bit. Uh. Yeah, it's just eh. Um, it was cheap, so it was a fi- it was a Firebird game. So it was two pound fifty, a whole two pound fifty. So it's fifty one pence more than your Masterbird, Masterbird, Mastertronic games. Um, so you know. But it you know, it's just proof that cheap doesn't. They did a lot, but Fiber did some amazing games for that budget range. Warhawk, for example, is in that range. So, um, so um, this is just a, a, a poor attempt at an arcade. I have a feeling that, but Fiber were picking up a lot of these um, programmer, early programmer. This is probably a young fifteen-year-old kid that made this because the Fiber did a lot of that back then, and then obviously, um, they, so this might be that particular programmer's first game i suspect three three or four games down when they've learned their craft a bit more the they're a bit better but i always admire that firebird and mastertronic gave some of them early publishers a chance uh, sorry early developers and game designers a chance because your big companies wouldn't even look twice at something like that um and so i i do have a little bit of a soft spot for some of the output from firebird and mastertronic but that doesn't excuse no games being utterly crap this isn't that this isn't utterly crap it's just not I think it's like somebody's first game. I've, I remember many moons ago, um, a student that um, was on a games course that I was teaching um, way back when. Um, they produced their first games often on those courses, and none of those particular games are amazing. But every now and again, you get one that's just bed, more playable than some of the others, and this would fall into that category for me. It wasn't terrible, but you know that that particular game creator is going to come up with something better three or four games later. There's no doubt about that. So it's it's yeah. all right, it's, but it's not all- great. It's a, it's a it's it's evidence of a, of a lack of playtesting. Um, where, where put it in the hands of a few people, and, and you'd suddenly realise that it's way too punishing and too hard, and, and they'll be like, "Okay, I need to tone tone it down a little bit." You know, it's, diff, difficulty is not a virtue um, in in all things. Sort of thing. It needs to feel fair. This doesn't feel altogether fair, and that's the, that's its issue. No. So it's okay. It's 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 we've come back up a slightly from our, our last few games we've looked at: Dan Buster's Blagger, Glider Pilot, Starfire, and Fire One. That's a bad run. Um, so Estra does bring us up slightly. It's it's okay. It's okay. It's just too punishing. You may get something from it. Um, you know, it's a nice idea. It's it's okay. Um, but it's it's it, it is what it is. Um, and there we go. That's our look at the games. And I think. Um, as ever, before we move into, if we want to look at some crap verts, if you want to look at them, um, recommendations. What are our recommendations from from our list? I think, I, 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 if I can go first, I think we're both gonna. I think Theatre Europe's a, a given. Yes, I think you think you have to you have to play it. I just think it might be missing something nowadays without the phone calls and the some of that scary stuff. But just YouTube some of that stuff if you can. Hmm. I think yeah. I think um, and turn and turn off the arcade bit when it says Do you want to play and just say no. Um, it's it's much 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 better. So see yeah, Europe. I think. Uh, yeah. What do you want to throw in? Um, I would put in there. Uh, I think on court tennis deserves to be in there. I think it's a good. I don't like tennis games myself, so it tells you that it must be okay for me to be recommending it. But it's 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 it plays like a good fun tennis game, and I think it's well ahead of its its com- its um, other sports games around at that time. So definitely on court tennis. I'd put in the in our little uh, archive. Mm-hmm. And and I would uh, add uh, Super Pipeline Two. Yes, I think I would agree with you there. Actually, I think it's a really good, clever little game that and and good fun. Yeah, and I think if you look at those three games, like sort of bit hardcore sim, hard, well hardcore strategy, sort of you know playable sports game and classic arcade game, I think that's a that's a good spread of genres and games for 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 this sort of episode i think that's a interesting bunch of interesting bunch to play i think if i was going to put any of those games in the this game should never have been made seal of doom <laughs> and then put it in a vault that could never be opened for the rest of time it would be glider pilot for me i i think so I, as much as i think i think the two epics ones are worse games starfire and fire one but they're games at least they're just bad games glider pilot defies understanding <laughs> uh, I just wonder like, where do you go in your I'm going to create simulations um, where do you go with it after you've created the great glider pilot the, what, in a kite what simulator could be duller? flying a kite maybe 
Um, uh, tr- trailer simulator. So you just sit in a trailer yeah, ra- on the back of a radio car. control car simulator. <laughs> um, I don't know. Um, paper folding simulations would be pretty boring. <laughs> what's, I would duller, what's duller than being in a glider? Um, not uh, being. <laughs> that's only, that's only what he's invented. Is the exact thing that's more dull than being a glider pilot. Not being one, but pretending you are. That's twice as bad. <laughs> all the, all <laughs> glider, pi- glider pilot pilot simulator. Do you know what? You could actually save yourself the money for that. Just sit in a chair and look out the window and perfectly stand up and sit down. Because that's exactly the same feeling you're going to get from that game. Well, not even you'd even get the feel of gravity if you did it for real. If you just sit there and look up and look down periodically, that's essentially what you do in that game for an hour. So just save yourself ten quid, get a chair, sit by the window, look at the grass, look at the sky, look at the grass, look at the sky, look at the grass, look at the sky. <laughs> do that for an hour, and there you go. You've you probably completed the game. So there's a there's a don't play um, ever. Consider it. Don't ever. And, and our our games that we would actually recommend you go look at because we do think they still stand up today. So let's just round off with a quick look at any good adverts that came out for video games in this period. Um, <clears throat> I did the first one I've dropped in here sort of thing, so I've, I've, I've pulled out quite a few. We'll, we won't look at all of them. Um, obviously, somebody had a word with whoever did the... Um, uh, shadow fire advert because they took <laughs> off the shadow and the fire <laughs> so you can actually read it this this month um uh, which made me laugh when i saw that um i just thought i'd mention that because it's worth looking at last month um and this month because last month they obviously took the word shadow and fire very literally um and on this month uh they they realized no actually <laughs> we, we need to see the because actually it's, it's quite you know it's an all right advert. That that covers all right. It's, it's not terrible. It's boobalicious. Oh, absolutely. It's, got, it's, it's very heavy, It's heavy on the boobs, and and the anatomy of whatever that thing is coming out for, from behind her leg with the crazy reachy out arm thing scares me. Uh, but it's better than the previous one. And the reflector ball in the, just over the shoulder oh, of the yeah. guy on the right is also nice. Yeah, yeah, it, that, there was a certain stage with artwork in the sort of mid eighties to late nineties where you had to have a reflective ball. It was kind of that, <laughs> that and um, writing that what looked like the... it was made out of uh, molten um, uh, molten metal of some description, like mercury, a kind of like chromium effect. You had loads of that. Wasn't wasn't there a demo on the Amiga with the uh, reflective ball? Yeah, with the sort famously, of checkerboard yeah, the floor. juggling, but it juggled the clown, the clown juggling the three balls. Very famous uh, ray tracing, first ray tracing demo, I think something like that. But that it's not, that isn't what this advert is. This is a scantily clad woman with a boobs hanging out stood provocatively waving a gun at uh a, a, is that a, what is that it's like a monkey with a long arm and a man i think anyway, it's, I don't know. I don't it's, know. A, it's a droid i think it's a dog droid, I'm not but there is a shadow fire out of that there is a there is, there is a hawk man in the back left though there is and there's what looks like zardoz uh, flying over the top <laughs> so there you go you know, it's, it's something for everyone in that game <laughs> absolutely as long as sean connery doesn't um, appear in his underpants you're good um next up there's i don't know if you want to Say anything about the Quasimodo advert? Yeah, it's too much text. It's, there's a lot. They, they did that with some of them. It's a bit. It's a bit. Like I said to you when we first talked about Hunchback, I don't think you'd get away with some of these notions in games um, nowadays so much. You know, at the end of the day, you've got kind of a um, a graphic depiction of a deformity there for for, for giggles, really. And the very first line, Quasimodo likes bells. They make him <laughs> yeah. feel good. They make him happy. They are his friends. It's kind of, it's a bit, I don't. It's not the best. No, it's a little bit mean, um, you know, but these are of their time. Um, what made me laugh more, well, not made me laugh more, but I like, the, it's quite a good advert in its own way, I suppose. But the Quasimodo writing at the top is inexplicable, really, for what that is. <laughs> And then at the bottom, it's, it's looks like he's got too many feet. It's just I don't get it. It, it is. It's like this looks like <laughs> it's text made out of legs and feet. It is. And if you notice that right at the top of that, I don't know if that's something to do with the 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 way that this scan has been done, or whether that was just that they took a picture. <laughs> there's the, but there's the punch there's hole. A punch hole for for some reason on there. Um, so you know maybe they just took a close up picture of it. I don't know. But uh, at the bottom there, you'll be pleased to know you can get this from Boots, W. H. Smith, John Menzies, Woolworth, or Wildlings. So um, I'm not sure. I never came across a wild <laughs> things ever in the whole of the UK in all the time That's I was buying you know, games. No, you, you know nothing. <laughs> I know nothing. So Graham, the, you know nothing, Graham <laughs> Rallings. <laughs> 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 
So did you know that the all the Wild Things uh, were really keen <laughs> Quasimodo <laughs> players? Well, now we know that. You know, it's a, it's I don't a know, fact. But also, I think Wildling sort of thing is, is euphemism because the very first next bit of text says "dealers" for information <laughs> how to become a US gold stockist. <laughs> like, <laughs> so we've got some druggists going there. Uh, Excel this. Just look at the complex array of licensing on that page as well. So you've got 64, Atari, US Gold, and Ocean on one page. Who made this game? Where did it I come don't from? Know. Is, it, so is it based it's on a, it's Atari a joint... Arcade? What's the 64 there for? I don't get it. I don't understand. It's a joint production. Yep. Yeah, it's better than the ones on the next page, of course, which were Falcon Patrol 2. <laughs> 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 it's like a realist that is I can't all right when I ask a question sort of thing here sort of thing is that Harrier massive or is it really close up and the pyramids are well, far away two things that are wrong with that <laughs> many things that are wrong with that so I'm thinking it's meant to be high up it can't be a Harrier jet because it doesn't have actual any actual uh, VTOL uh, so it, so it, even if it is it is never going to take off that way it's doing so it's I well, don't it's know. actually a Falcon, isn't it? Yeah, I suppose Falcon it's a, Patrol. It's, so. it, I don't know what. It I don't is. know what Falcon it's is. It's got but... a kind of a, the kind of paunch that children's characters <laughs> have when you when you draw these kind of airplanes. So it's, it's not streamlined and sleek. That thing's not aerodynamic. It's got kind of a Chuckington type vibe about that. Um, yeah, it does look a bit uh, Bertha. And the graph, yeah, exactly. And the graphics underneath on the game, the little screens are are not. I would I would argue that is not an authentic Harrier simulation. <laughs> so it is meant to be a Harrier. <laughs> Because it says they're authentic Harrier simulation minus the VTOL. Yeah, exactly, so, that, yeah. so as long as you don't mind that it doesn't have the one feature of the Harrier jump jet, which is its ability to take off and land vertically, as long as you don't mind that, it's accurate. Also it's as well, completely I do, accurate. <laughs> I do like as well the, the, this complete mix-up of text and, and just various words are just uh, bolded. Yeah. So Harrier jump jet, single-handedly, ferocious onslaught, enemy helicopters, trick. <laughs> <laughs> Barrages, <laughs> lethal missiles, deadly, built blind your vision. Those are the words that are bolded. So these are, these are early Virgin games, by the way. So yeah, blind your vision is more important than radar jammers. They are, mm. and then look at the game next to it. So strange loop. <laughs> so um, we might even end up coming across these games later down the line. I don't I haven't seen them. It might be you know we 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 don't we can't go through every single release that came out. There's so many, but. Um, and then if we go from the strange loop and the happy, chubby Harrier jet from there, even though it says Spectrum 48K in big letters on that game, and then it says at the top, now available on Spectrum, which is weird. Um, what in that strange loop advert, what's he doing with his left hand? Because pres- is he kind of controlling something? Is he, is he, is he, what? Because his right hand has got hold of something. Is that like a hammer? Or is, it, is it a steering wheel or something? Is he driving something? And so his left hand is. Grabbing the letters. Yeah. I don't know what's going on. It looks like a plunger or something, but it, like the way it says in a little sort of, um, dare you accept this mission, question mark. And then under the 250 screens of tough and challenging gameplay. So no is my answer to that. I don't want that. I don't want that mission. I, I also like as well at the bottom, right at the very, very bottom, in the sort of blurb at the bottom, which still looks like someone's just written in red biro. Oh yeah, what's that? <laughs> buy any two games and you will be eligible for one pound off each game it's like someone's just oh you forgot to put the offer on give us that biro give us it here i'll just write it on print it out that'll do it does look <laughs> that is literally written is in red ri- biro it's written some scribbled, scribbled that on there haven't they? <laughs> two for Vernon road portobello road london goodness me and then, just, you forgot to put the address on. You, you what are you doing, the key man? Information. You must have been suffering from incentive confusion. So, so they got a black biro and did like a little cloud at the bottom. It's terrible. <laughs> put some red, which is written in red biro in it, where it says two hits. When I first looked at that sort of thing, that didn't look like a two. <laughs> yes. So I, I was reading it. It's saying shits are better yeah, does than look, one. Shits are better than one. No, they're not though, because those aren't hits. You can't just say it's a hit. It has to actually become one. You can't just go, right, these games are hits. So they did that a lot though in these adverts in the 80s. Like, this game is a hit. It's like, yeah. And what do the fans think? Nah, they don't know what they're talking about. I know it's a hit. I made this game. It's a hit, that one. Absolutely. Um, but yes, let's move on to the. Conf- I put the confusion advert in there because it made me confused. Yes. What is it? 
<laughs> what is it? It's a spa- there's a sparkler with some green squares well, behind it. What it isn't is a fusion of mind and machine. Because <laughs> there's, there's, there's no mind and there's no machine. It looks to me like a magician's dropped a sparkler on a Rubik's Cube. <laughs> but, yeah, exactly. You know, in the dark. But there you go. Um, I wouldn't pay. And what's made me laugh there? Look, price six ninety five. Trade and credit card orders. What tradesman is going to buy that? Also, go, I'll tell you what, I'll take 200 also, of them incentive confusions you've got. I also like how the fact that this is out for the Commodore 64, the Commodore 64, <laughs> and the Commodore 64. <laughs> <laughs> a machine so good they had to tell us three times. I re- I'm wondering whether that's supposed to say Spectrum and Amstrad. Have, and they I'd, just I'd love to read another and go, do uh, this confusion, have you got it for the Sinclair Spectrum? <laughs> <laughs> Look, it says clearly in the advert three times. <laughs> you stupid idiot. Commodore 64. <laughs> <laughs> I've got a trade card. <laughs> yeah, I've got. I'm a tradesman. Do I get trade discount for having incentive confusion? What's it about? We don't know. It's a fusion of mind and machine. Buy it, I'll take it. Don't no, no, It's up to you. Then you come to the arguably cheap. The, love, the, the lovely. I, I put this in because I couldn't believe there was an advert for this. <laughs> um, you may remember us talking about Tim loves cricket. Um, in a previous episode, and then there were, we found an advert for it. And according to Central TV... Which I severely <laughs> doubt the legitimacy <laughs> of that reference. <laughs> they say that it's better than the real thing. Why? Central TV! <laughs> when, when? For those who don't remember, ITV used to be split into regions. So in the 80s, you had Central, Yorkshire, Tyne Tees, Thames, Anglia. So Central TV was set around, obviously, Central, Central England. So Leicester, I guess, and all that area. Um, you still get it on regional broadcasts, I guess, somewhere. Else. But they said it's better than the real thing. Tim loves cricket. It's really not. <laughs> and I hate cricket. <laughs> exactly. There's, a, there's so many things wrong with this advert. So in fact, I doubt that, it's, that that is a real quote. And it's also a lie. Um, <laughs> I don't believe that it's real fantastic detail and the graphics are 100% and the value. I don't believe any of that at all because I've seen the animation. That is not fantastic detail. No. What baffles me is that this was made in Newark and I'm pretty sure Newark is not a central place <laughs> for cricket in the UK ever. ever. Um, I could be wrong. Um, but I also don't believe it's total joystick control over amazing 3D graphics because it really is not at all. It's keyboard control. You don't control it with a joystick. It's god awful. It's awful. That is, I, that's awful. That's such a that, everything about the advert's a lie. Everything it, apart from the yeah. price. I reckon. I reckon that Central TV did actually say better than the real thing, um, but they weren't talking about this game. <laughs> yes, I agree. <laughs> so, so they just they heard them say it. And went, well, you said it. Yeah, we didn't say about this game though. We didn't say you did. We just put it on there. <laughs> well, let's compare that to the. It's god awful. Compare that advert to the Airwolf advert that's on the next page. Well, the reason I put the Airwolf advert in sort of thing is because. Why is it portrait? <laughs> That's how it is in the ad in the mag. Because that that yellow bit on the left sort of thing, that if you you can't see this picture sort of thing, but you can see the the. I thought, oh, maybe they've just cut this wrong, but no, no, no. This is this is actually what we're describing is an advert for an airwolf. So there's a big picture of airwolf. It's got the airwolf logo on it and all the details sort of thing. Except it's a landscape picture that's been put in the magazine portrait. Well, I I think I know why they've done that. And I think it's because at that time, this was a very, really, we said it last week when we, uh, last time, I'm sorry, when we reviewed this in episode one, Airwolf was massively popular, right? At that time, huge. And I think they've done it that way so you could tear it out and put it up on your wall as a poster. Uh, that's a good point. That's, so, yeah, yeah. Because okay, it's, you know, it's, it's I, a full size picture of the <coughs> Airwolf helicopter. <coughs> Everyone loved that helicopter. I have to tell you, it's not a particularly amazing helicopter as helicopters go, but it did look the part in the TV show. And it made that kind of noise when it flew, yeah. which everyone was like, wow. But It's that, nicely rounded, isn't it? Yeah, it's, it's not an Apache gunship, of course, but that was Blue Thunder, wasn't it? But either way, I think that's why they've done it. I think it was a pull-out, which is kind of terrifying as well, in its own sort of weird way that people will go, wow, put that on your wall. That's a great Airwolf picture. Um, where's the pictures of Stringfellow Hawk, Dominic Santini, um, Archangel? No, they don't even get a look in, do they? This was all about that helicopter, right? And with good cause, let's face it. Yes, yes, it was. Yes, um, you don't want Ernest Borgnine's visage leaning out of the, you know that you know sleek helicopter. No, and let's face it, you know when they had special helmets made for this TV show when they wore them. Fine if you're a you know high cheeked Scandinavian Norwegian looking fellow like. Um, uh, Jean Michael Vincent or Stringfellow Hawk, as he was known in the show, but Ernest Borgnine was a big, round-headed guy with a gap in his teeth. It just looked, it just looked stupid. <laughs> it didn't look right. 
didn't look right. <laughs> yeah, it did not. And I question okay, the ability well, of any fighter pilot in an aeroplane, because Archangel flew uh, AWOLF at one point, and he's got one eye. Come on. one eye helicopter pilots don't exist. Sorry, they just don't. Uh, maybe he'd been on glider simulator for a while. <laughs> figured out how to do it. Maybe, maybe figured he's <laughs> so, like, yeah, I'll be all right. Anyway, the Airwolf right. advert's great. I like the, I've always liked the Elite logo because of that. It's like Chromium effect I was saying earlier. It's got that Chrome effect oh, it's, on it. it uh, that's, it's, it's so 80s. It's, um, <laughs> it's beyond belief it, it, 80s. It, 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 yeah. Yeah. All right, let's move on. So we've got uh, Gyron. Yes, yeah, a five. Uh, which you can, you can win a... You can win a Porsche 924 or cash equivalent. Wow, okay. Uh, it's from Firebird. Yeah. Uh, no idea what it says. It just says, take the challenge, and it's got some kind of Aztec circle. So and there's there's a little throwback in that advert. I mean, that, that doesn't give anything away, does it, at all? No. Classic Firebird adverts all. where they don't mean anything whatsoever, which means the game will have no nothing to do with that at all, probably. Um, but notice right at the bottom of there, there's the British Telecom T, because Firebird oh, yeah. were a subsidiary of British Telecom for a long time and I think that I still find that fascinating that BT you know as they are now British Telecom uh, uh, big, were releasing games under a label called Firebird just seems really odd um, why wow, that's the gold edition anyway and again it's got the 48k Spectrum advert on it so that's a mystery yeah as uh, logos go I always did like the Firebird logo yeah I think it's cool it's got it's very 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 uh, Japanese very inspired yeah, by absolutely. Japanese arcade yeah. but I like that you know it's cool it is, yeah. It's very nice. Um, what was our next one? Can you solve the mystery of Ashkaron? No. Featuring the new, unique new walkthrough graphic system. <laughs> Can you? <laughs> I like the way it Can says you? it's a hundred percent machine code real time. It's like it's like some it's like talking <laughs> to some Bangkok hooker. <laughs> me, me, real time adventure. Me code you long time. Hundred percent Ashkaron. Me machine code real time featuring walkthrough. Walk through graphic system. I love this. Where you go is what you see. <laughs> oh, that's so hurt my head. <laughs> Generally, good, good what? advice. What? Where I go is what I see? Whichever way you turn, your new location opens up in perspective before your very eyes. I mean, uh, that's, it's like one of those statements. It's so obvious. I can't. I think there's some double meaning to it. But where you go is what you see. I'm like, yeah, of course it is. <laughs> <laughs> you don't need to tell me that. It's mirror soft. I suspect you that- go over there. You see over there. I know. No, and, it, and if it's got such a revolutionary walkthrough graphics system, why not put a picture of it on the bloody advert? Yeah, right? whichever way you turn, your new location opens out in perspective before your very eyes. I know. Yeah, that would be rubbish if it didn't. You know, but this is again, it's a mirror soft game, so uh, yeah, that's bad. <laughs> uh, the next, the next one's not an advert so much as uh, this was from Computer and Video Games, and this was um, a typing adventure. Um, we've had Quasimodo, we've had Hunchback, <laughs> now we've got Hunchy. <laughs> Good old Hunchy. <laughs> Hunchy. <laughs> Hunchy. <laughs> so this is a type typing adventure where you can make your own adventure game, with, or whatever it was, type your own arcade game in a computer and video games called Hunchy. Oh my goodness me. Hunchy. It's just Hunchy. A- <laughs> <laughs> I mean, that drawing's pretty good for... You know, if you're going to draw a disfigured man hanging off a rope near a church bell, um, yeah, absolutely. Looking I at think, a staircase, think... the bad the staircase seems badly out of perspective in that. But um, you know, I don't draw well, so I'm not an expert. I'm also pretty Punchy sure. That, well, I'm also pretty sure that his thigh leg parts are longer than his. You know, his knees are in the wrong place. I'm just I'm not an anatomy expert, but he is a hunchy, so all bets are off, really. So, good old hunchy. <laughs> have you seen have you seen Quasimodo anywhere oh aren't she oh he's up, he's up in the bells mate got bells you find him up there aren't she aren't she <laughs> he loves bells yeah. he, he said loves so his earlier. bells aren't she aren't she <laughs> this guy to say aren't she oh he's deaf in one ear you know all that the, bell ringing he does bloody bells alone <laughs> well just put the bell put the bell down oh he loves his bells he loves his bells <laughs> aren't she uh, <laughs> bloody hunchy. Uh and finally our last one um, fantastic voyage. Well, anyone that could fire a fire a fire a pistol in the underwater is doing well in my book. <laughs> Not underwater, remember, it's in a brain. Oh, of course, it's, oh, it's fantastic it's voyage, fast, isn't it? Yeah, of course it is. It's ba- loosely. I, I want to know tremendously also, well, loosely based on the film, right? I want to know what Mighty Magus is though, and that really, really sort of like quite artistic dragon. Yeah, thing I don't. Think, in the bottom left, my feeling is that's got so little to do with. 
Is that another game, or is, what is that? I don't know. <laughs> I don't know. I don't know if it's two different games. You've got Fantastic Voyage, which I presume is that's the graphics from it. Because it's got the human body and I wonder thing. if it's like bits it, of toys and halves or something. It's some kind of two-page. And then it says right? mouth. And then we've got Mighty Magus from Quicksilver. And, you know, twenty cent the game of the film by 20th Century Fox. That's, I mean... Really little. Yeah, because I it's think like, they probably, probably didn't get official permission for that. Man, something no. tells me that 20th Century Fox don't know anything about that. And they went, no. so... Uh, this, uh, Who authorised this? Yeah, exactly. <laughs> So, some, some, official, some exec at Fox. Exactly. So He's, you're telling me that a little company from Wimborne, Dorset, got the green light <laughs> from 20th Century Fox to make a video game version of one of their most spectacular, at the time, spectacular special effects blockbusters that in of its time. It was a big blockbuster movie, that, with big famous people in it. Um, so uh, I suspect there may be some artistic license, and I'm surprised. But they, they, it was a bit of a free-for-all at that time, wasn't it, in the games world? Yeah. So who knows? It could be real. It might not be. But I do like the fact that it's just basically some uh, diver firing. I yeah. don't know. It looks like a crap a fire. Crap notes of yes, odd. They're, <coughs> they're a bent bird. <laughs> what in the visual? Yeah. It just says <laughs> <Bent>. mouth. <laughs> so that's... Yeah, I love that. I do like that sort of thing. Mouth. <laughs> mouth. Where am I? Mouth. And it looks like it says at the top there, time infinite, no infections. I think that's meant to be. So. I guess some kind of dental simulation, I'm thinking, but I can just imagine the crappy, blocky red mouth graphics and, you know, ugh, oh, doesn't bear thinking about what the sound effects are There's nothing fantastic like. about that voyage. Nope, 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 nope. No. And I think on that note, we will leave you sort of thing. So there are our um, crap birds for the for the, uh, for the the week, or the bi or whatever it is. So then, um, this has been another episode of Zap to the Past. I've been your host, Adrian Mills, joined by... Graham Raddings. Graham Raddings, of course. Um, we've looked at a number of games there, um, and we've given you our recommendations. Um, apart from another couple, don't play the rest. It's not worth your time. Um, and avoid uh, Hunchy, I think, is the message <laughs> yeah. from uh, this. Spot avoid Hunchy. Hunchy. <laughs> avoid Hunchy and cuddly... Uh, uh, Harrier jump jets. Yes, definitely. Is that's, the message. I think that's a very, very succinct and very telling message. Um, so I think on that bombshell. <laughs> uh, and remember, Tim loves cricket. <laughs> <laughs> and we'll see you next time. See you next time. Thank you for listening to the Zap to the Past podcast. We hope you enjoyed our deep dive into the world of Commodore 64 games, as well as the music, sights, sounds and news from around the 1980s, driven, of course, by the issue of Zap 64 magazine published at the time. We will be back next week with another podcast, so do please join us. Until then, please head over to zaptothepast.com to sign up to our email list, as well as check out all the links and resources in the show notes. You will also find us on Facebook, Twitter and Instagram under Zap to the Past. The Zap to the Past podcast is written and produced by Adrian Mills and Graham Raddings and recorded at Flaky Bits 2.0 Studio. All opinions expressed are those of the writers and while we indeed love Zap64 magazine, the Zap to the Past podcast is not affiliated with it in any way. Stay safe and see you next time. <laughs>